Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Dante Tapo, and I'm one of our two student fellows this year. Now, my name is Italian, uh, but I don't speak the language. The only words I know either refer to food or are inappropriate in this polite company. Though my grandfather and grandmother, both children of Italian immigrants to New York in the 1930s, speak it fluently, neither thought to teach my father or his brothers the language, and as a result, now I don't know it. In their childhoods, assimilation was expected, and that expectation was passed to their children and grandchildren. The complicated social processes and psychologies that mediate the process by which a nation incorporates an immigrant community are the subject of much debate, and in America, much of that debate is uncivil and uninformed. Fortunately, we have experts like Dr. Marcelo Suarez Orozco, who succeeded in clarifying and illuminating the conversation. Dr. Suarez Orozco is the Wasserman Dean and Distinguished Professor of Education at UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Sciences, where he leads two academic departments, 16 research institutes, and two demonstration schools. His research primarily focuses on the conceptual and empirical problems in areas of cultural psychology and psychological anthropology with an emphasis on mass migration, globalization, and education. In 2012, he founded the Institute for Immigrant Children, Youth, and Families at UCLA, which he co-directs. Dr. Suarez Orozco is an award-winning writer whose books are widely published and his scholarly papers range in discipline and languages and appear in major journals in the United States and around the world. An engaged public intellectual, Dr. Suarez Orozco is a regular contributor to national and international media outlets on, uh, where he often comments on Latino immigrant families and children and assimilation and education issues. He served as a special advisor for education, peace, and justice to the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. He authored briefs for the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Pope Francis's main scientific advisory board. So, as always, audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcelo Suarez Orozco. Grazie mille, Dante, Dante, veramente magnifica introduzione. Muchas gracias, buenas noches, thank you so much. Dante, that was magnificent. That's the kind of introduction that my father would have liked and my mother would have believed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm so happy, I'm so delighted um, to share this, uh, in this ma magnificent setting some thoughts on um, the world of mass migration, globalization, and, uh, and education. And I'm especially delighted uh, to be here at, at, the, uh, at, at the colleges. Um, I've never visited, so this is my, uh, my first time. Um, I recently had lunch with Mr. Day in LA, and I'll tell him that his uh, philanthropy is doing marvelous, marvelous work uh, uh, here in um, in uh, in the colleges. Um, I want to thank, uh, in addition to Dante, I want to thank uh, uh, Tony Jimenez, my former student uh, at at Harvard. Um, I want to thank uh, Dean uh, Maria Torres for her her hospitality and, and, and generosity, uh, and I'm just simply delighted uh, to be here. I, I, I'm new-ish to LA, so we went from no cars back east uh, to having two cars here, and every time I get into my car, I put in the destination, and it tells me 25 minutes. So I, it took me three hours to get here <laughs> from, from UCLA, so I'm always, um, um, excited not to be in the car, so I'm, I'm, happy, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Uh, the two takeaway points this evening uh, is that we're witnessing worldwide the confluence of two extraordinary formations. Mass migration's deep demographic echo, the rise of the children of immigrants, now the fastest growing sector of the child and youth population in nearly every high-income country in the world. And 
growing levels of inequality that are increasingly naturalized as the new normal. The implications of these two extraordinary formations for education moving forward are phenomenal. The world is on the move. And every continent on Earth today is experiencing the massive movements of people as areas of immigration, as transit areas, and as areas of uh, immigration. In many, many countries, this is all three mechanisms are happening at once. Um, I was recently invited by the Holy Father, by Pope Francis, to give the keynote address to all the Central American uh, foreign ministers on the crisis of the uh, unaccompanied minors in, in the EFE, at the Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores in, Me in Mexico. And what is amazing is that Mexico is a paradigm of this confluence of all three mechanisms at once. Mexico is a country of immigration, it's a country of emigration, and it's a huge transit uh, country. So this is increasingly a, a, a global phenomena. Uh, the data here that I'm presenting suggests that the largest movements of people worldwide now are taking place in Asia. They're not taking place in the Americas, they're not taking place in Europe, um, but rather they're taking in South and West, uh, West Asia, and uh, also within Africa. So if you, if you had to identify the three most important centers for mass migration in the 21st century, uh, Asia, uh, the, the North-South corridor between Latin America and the United States, and uh, within Africa, um, migration. But what's very important to keep in mind is that migration is constitutive of the human experience. Migration is written in our genetic code. It is in our bipedalism. It is, it, it's in our stereoscopic vision. It's in our neocortex. Migration maketh man. And today, when half of all migrants globally are women, migration maketh women. In our country, furthermore, migration is both history, as Dante alluded, and as the data I'm going to share with you this evening will suggest, it's our destiny. It's our history, it's our destiny. And Dante, before I forget, one of my neighbors in Cambridge put it best. He said, the US, we are a cemetery for languages. The Italians brought Italian, the Japanese brought Japanese, the Germans brought German, and all these languages have been safely buried in our country. I'm gonna leave you with a question of whether Spanish will break the kind of the compulsive monolingualism that has been at the center of the cultural narrative of immigration in our country for now two centuries. The movement of people is, of course, in our country, fundamental. It's fundamental to the narrative of how we became the country we are today, from the settlements of the first Americans to the various waves of uh, Spanish and Swedish explorers. There's a wonderful piece, by the way, by the Norwegian novelist in the Sunday magazine uh, of the New York Times about retracing the steps of the first sort of Nordic uh, arrivals in Newfoundland and, uh, and, 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 and Canada and, and then their migration uh, southward. So you, you may want to look at that piece. Um, when you have time. But of course, it's, it was the Spaniards, it was the, 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 uh, the Scandinavians, it was the English Puritans, it was the Northern Europeans. It was a mass involuntary movement of Africans to slave in the plantations of the New World. It was this, the exodus of the of the, of the Irish, it was the exodus of the Eastern Europeans, it was the great exodus of the Italians. Italy sent uh, five plus million, Europe shed about 50 million of its souls to the New World. Mostly they came to our cities. They made New York and Boston and Montreal and Buenos Aires and, and uh, the history of that 
massive exodus is the history of how, in many ways, we came to be the country we are today. And of course, in, in, in more recent times, we talk about a new migration, and that is a, a migration wave that has Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia as the main sources. The point is that in our country, immigration is constitutive of the narrative of the nation. It is how we became the country we are today. Yet for all its normative claims in history and prehistory, immigration today creates vertigo, anxiety. It is at once superficially familiar, yet deeply strange, ominous, disturbing, what Freud called the uncanny. It's familiar, but not familiar. It is at once appealing and horrifying. We don't get to do this in the social sciences very often, but here you have it. We have, um, I don't know if this is working or not, but we have a, we have a day here when, when mass migration skyrocketed, and we have a day when mass unauthorized immigration came to a, to a near uh, halt. Global migration rapidly intensified November 9th, 1989. Any European history majors here? What happened that day? The fall of the Berlin Wall, right? That day saw the beginning of an unprecedented movement of, uh, of people. And unauthorized immigration began to significantly slow down on September 15th, 2008. I won't expect that you remember what happened on that day. I, this is five blocks from my old office at, at NYU, there was a company called Lemon Brothers. They filed from bankruptcy. That's the day all of us in academia realized we can't retire because our pensions collapse, right? So from the, from the, the generation, right, the parenthesis between the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of Lehman Brothers marks a, an extraordinary way, wave of mass, mass migration. Those were the heady days of the end of history. You might remember that catchy book, uh, and of course the Washington Consensus, right? The high priest of that Washington Consensus was my boss, Larry Summers, then president of, uh, of Harvard, the former secretary of the, of the Treasury. During that generation, global migration went from approximately 115 plus million to way over 230 million the figure um, for the most recently available uh, data. At the same time, it is important to keep in mind a fundamental continuity in patterns of mass migration worldwide. The rate of immigration has remained an extraordinarily steady 2.8 to roughly 3.2 of the world's total population, meaning there's been very, very little fluctuation as a ratio of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the global uh, population. So you, here you have it by, by decades, the number of, of, of migrants. So you do 41 million, you, you, you do the math, that's basically about 3% of the, of, the, of the population of the world then. And of course, uh, in our country, immigration today is not at an all-time high. The percentage, the rate of immigration as a function of the U.S. population to, is, was at a higher rate in the first decade of the 20th century than it is in the first decade of the 21st century. 
So while the number of immigrants has grown, the ratio of immigration is not unprecedented given the history of our country. Here is something new. Up to 1965, the vast majority of immigrants to the United States were Europeans. This is now history. Today, 10, when you look at the 10 leading countries of immigration to the United States, they're all Latin American, Caribbean, or Asian, constituting the so-called new immigration. What I call the new, new immigration is what happened after Lehman Brothers, not 9-11, by the way. Lehman Brothers had a much deeper impact on the movement of unauthorized people than the largest military buildup in the history of the U.S. border. This is a triumph of economy over politics in the old Bavarian sense of, of, of that equation. Lehman Brothers, this, the, the slowing down of the U.S. economy did much more to interrupt patterns of unauthorized immigration than the entire militarization of the U.S. southern border. Today, roughly a third of all immigrants originate in one country. Mexico now only recently surpassed what was the country that sent the most, uh, most Americans trace their descent to what country? This has changed now with, with Mexico. Germany. Germ now Mexico is taking the place of Germany. It's the largest movement of people in recorded history between two destinations, the Mexico-US migration flow. By the midpoint of the 21st century, then, the United States will become the first advanced post-industrial democracy in history to reach this kind of mythical status of minority-majority a threshold that we crossed in California 15 years ago. Um, and here is my memo to the Republican Party. <laughs> By 2052, the majority of eligible voters in our country will be ethnic minorities. Mass migration is the human face of globalization, the sounds, colors, smells of a miniaturized, interconnected, and fragile world. In Boston, in Berlin, in Buenos Aires, just as in many, many other global cities today, diversity defines the demographic, social, and cultural rhythms. Globally, migration is generating an unprecedented echo. In our two largest cities, Los Angeles and New York, this morning, Children whose families originate in 190 different countries and territories got up, had breakfast, got into bikes, got into cars, got into subways. If you're in the East Coast, you put a lot of coats <laughs> before you left the house and went to schools. That's something that never happened before in the history of the world. The city now encompasses the entire range of the human experience. In our own city of Los Angeles, we see something that, again, never happened before in the history of the world. Jefferson used to say, we all have two cities, our own and Paris, right? The founding fathers were all in love with Paris. The world today has two capitals their own, and Los Angeles. Today, over a dozen countries in the world have LA as their second largest city. Armenia, Cambodia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Iran, Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, 
Mexico, the list goes on and on. The second largest population for those countries now is in Los Angeles. Globalization and mass inequality are the most disruptive forces in education in 100 years. Globalization, I define as three M's, markets, their integration and disintegration, media, the new information, communication, and media technologies that not only deterritorialize labor, but also put a premium on knowledge-intensive work. And the third, the human face of globalization, mass migration. If you want to understand why people migrate, you need to understand the synergies between the three. The insertion of China into the global system of production, consumption, distribution of goods and services, the economy. We were talking with the students today, a lot of your students are interested in China. The insertion of China into global capital has generated the largest movement of people ever seen internally in world history. There are more children in China separated by migration than there are people in Canada. There are about 35 million children who are separated. We're going to come back to this issue of unauthorized immigration, separation in our own country. But to just give you a perspective, in India, in India, we estimate that from now to the midpoint of the 21st century, 700 million people will be moving from the rural areas into the mega cities of the 21st century. That's two United States in one. Markets, media, migration is responsible for the movement of people on a planetary, on a planetary scale. Globalization challenges the deep structures of the nation state and interrupt the taken for granted Herdelian, Herderian ideals of the German romantics the longing for alignment and coherence, qua language, identity, the region, das Volk in Herder's term. These ideals are deep in the mitochondrial DNA of the Prussian education systems we've inherited, are made increasingly anachronistic by the deep forces of globalization in the 21st century. If globalization is the macro context of mass migration, the family is its meso context. Here's my definition, an N of one for whatever is worth. Immigration is an ethical act of and for the family. It's a family affair. An ethic of family nurturance, reciprocity, caregiving animates global migration today. It is what drives Uzbeks to Russia, the second largest country of immigration in the world, Indians, Indonesians, and Filipinos to the Gulf countries. I recently delivered a series of lectures in Abu Dhabi. There you have something that the world had never seen before. Over 90% of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the labor force is foreign born. This is another one of these gifts or curses of globalization, where you can imagine your entire labor force to be imported from the outside. It is what drives Senegalese, Algerians, and Moroccans to France, Chinese to Canada, Brazilians to Japan, Ecuadorians and Romanians to Italy, and of course, Latin Americans, Caribbeans, and Asians to our country. At a time of growing inequality, as the French economist Thomas, Thomas Piketty suggests in his magnum, opus magnum, Capital in the 21st Century, at a time when the returns to capital dwarf the returns to labor, millions of workers make themselves most relevant by leaving family members behind. They're there by not being there. 
thus creating fragile, long-distance family systems of authority, nurturance, and cohesion that now involve hundreds of millions of people the world over. This is not an LA issue, a New York issue, a, a Miami issue. This is a global issue in the 21st century. Last year, over $350 billion in remittances flowed from the developing world, from, the, from immigrants in the developed world to the developing world. To give you a sense of the math, that's three times the entire OECD, and if you don't know what the OECD is, you can ask your advisors tomorrow, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The, this, this, the, the professors in the audience will remember this as the, the Marshall Plan. This is what funneled the, the funds that rebuilt Europe. And we left the, the architecture for that was the OECD. What immigrants repatriate back to the developing world is now three times the total OECD, that's a club of rich nations, given aid to the entire developing world. So again, do the math, that's less than 3% of the world's population. While the rate of remittances have slowed, it remains proportionally higher than other flows flowing across uh, borders, economic development, other interventions. It is, uh, I, I, I was uh, um, at the World Bank and one of the World Bank uh, economists put it, the largest poverty reduction effort the world has ever seen. It's the repatriation of, of current use um, funding from migrants to the relatives back home. Because immigration is off and for the family, immigrant children are now the fastest growing sector of the child population in a growing number of disparate countries, including Canada, 90% of all the growth in Canada moving forward will be the children of immigrants. Italy, I was recently in Reggio Emilia, the best preschools in the world are in Reggio Emilia. The Italian Prime Minister asked me to give a keynote address on globalization and education, and the place that hosted the event was Reggio Children. Reggio Children, of course, is where the great Loris Malaguzzi taught the world what children can learn when you listen to what he called the 100 languages of children. Right? 40% of the children in Reggio Emilia, Reggio Emilia is right next to Modena, where they make all the beautiful Italian cars that uh, they, everybody drives in LA except the academics. <laughs> the Ferraris and the Maseratis, they're all made there. Right? This is very high precision, high. 40% uh, um, of the children in Reggio Emilia are non-Italian children of immigrants. How many of you like the Italian cheese, the Reggio the Parmigiano Romano? Right? It's the best cheese. It's 100%, 100% now in the hands of Indian immigrants from the Punjab. 100%. I went to visit the, the cheese making the, where they make the Reggiano, which is fantastic. In Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, we were talking about the Netherlands in our table, Two-thirds, two-thirds of the children that got up to go to schools this morning come from non-Dutch immigrant origin households. Two-thirds. In Stockholm, 40% of the children that went to schools this morning come from non-Swedish immigrant origin households. Sweden is a fascinating case because Sweden sent about a million and a half migrants to our country, right, to Minnesota. Indiana. You've also Fargo, right? Sweden today, a hundred years later, captured back all the immigrants it lost. It has 1.5 million immigrants. You do the math, a country of about 9 million people, they have a rate of immigration that is higher than the rate of immigration in our country. Even though you ask Swedish folk, are you a country of Immigrants, and they shake their heads. Berlin, 40% of the children in Berlin today come from non-German immigrant origin homes. It's 
the Germans woke up to understand that there is nothing more permanent than guest workers. They went into this deal with their eyes wide shut without fundamentally understanding what this was going to do to their country. In our country, the data are breathtaking. These are the numbers of new births. So there's uh, four million uh, fewer white European origin uh, babies born in, uh, these are the 210 data from the 210 census. Uh, and, but look, look at, the, look at the, 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 the extraordinary growth in terms of the, the Asian, the, the two plus races, and look at the Hispanic. The, uh, the black population of the United States is, is pretty stable, but there is a massive inflow of immigrants. Um, half of all blacks in New York are foreign born, half. Over the last generation, a generation is 20 years, twice as many blacks have come as immigrants as during the entire Middle Passage. There isn't a piece of the American that is in touch by mass migration. For the first time in US history, the children of Latinos, Asians, and African and African Caribbean origin children will account for nearly all the growth in the child population. New data suggest that between 2000 and 2010, the number of Latino and Asian children skyrocketed by more than 5.5 million, while the number of non-Hispanic whites has declined significantly by over 4 million. This is how you get to the hyper-diversity in our child and youth population uh, today. These are the states in our country that are already in the under 18 population, minority majority states. Remember that there's a magic number when the country will cross that threshold in, within a generation. But many states already there in the, um, in the child and youth population. This is part of an unprecedented demographic shift this, the locus of power in our, in our country slowly migrating from the northeast to the southwest. As the entire population movement is shifting west of the Mississippi. This, is, this mass movement of people, the demographic echo it has generated, the rise of the children of immigrants as the fastest growing sector of our demography is taking place in the context of another major transformation, growing inequality. Again, I turn to the French economist, Thomas Piketty, who deploying vast historic and comparative data suggests that inequality is now poised to surpass previous historic records. As the returns to capital out, outpace the returns to labor, that's the, the, the central hypothesis of the Piketty uh, um, claim, uh, we have inequality returning to pharaohic proportions. In this context then, education takes on a new democra demo democratic urgency. In a Capital in the 21st century, Piketty writes, quote, historical experience suggests that the principal mechanism for convergence of incomes at the international as well as the domestic level is the diffusion of knowledge. In other words, in what is a very controversial phrase, I'm quoting from Piketty now, in other words, I continue, the poor catch up with the rich to the extent they achieve the same level of technological know-how, skill, and education. End of quote. Here you have the rates of of um, household wealth in historical uh, proportion. 
where a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, minority now has wealth of just pharaohic proportions compared to the bottom 90% of the U.S. wealth distribution. Inequality in America is deeply racialized. People of color pay a penalty. This is, these are the data on median wealth by race, and you see gigantic gaps that remain. From pre-K, in fact, we have data suggesting uh, for example, with the unauthorized, I'm going to share some data with the, uh, on uh, a study we just completed, that by age three, net of all other factors, there are cognitive delays that are associated with, with poverty and with unauthorized status. So from pre-K to college, you see the massive echo inequality creates in our country. These are the college graduation rates by income distribution. Tolstoy starts Anna Karenina with that eternal, beautiful line, all families are happy the same way, but each family is unhappy in its own way. Each country today is unhappy in its own way. We have three protracted problems in qua education in the United States. First, the paradigm of inequality we've been discussing, what my former colleague Bill Wilson at Harvard calls the burden of concentrated disadvantage, the issues uh, of my, my current colleague, uh, Gary Orfield, uh, at UCLA of triple segregation, and generally the widely acknowledged general failure to fully integrate large numbers of children of color in the United States and other high-income countries. In our country, we perfected a model now, which is just foolproof. It's the the, the, the school-to-prison pipeline. It's, it's, um, it's, it's cheaper to come to the colleges um, today than to be housed in the, in the criminal justice system in New York State or in, or, or in the state of California. This is what we've become. This is the numero uno uh, issue, the, 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 concentra the, the, the return of inequality uh, and the unfinished business of equality and the racialization of disadvantage in our country. Second is the issue, an issue that we discovered about 25 years ago uh, in a study we did. We did a very basic sentence completion test. We asked kids in schools, fill in the sentence. School is, fill in the sentence. So what's the, what's the answer to that? Boring. School is boring. So boredom is the elephant in the classroom. If you're a minority boy in our country, there's a binary affect here. The phenomenology of experience is either boredom or fear. Now, cognitive neuroscientists will tell you this is not ideal for learning. It's not ideal for education. Okay, but this is the binary, the phenomenology of experience of, of children in our schools is they're bored, they're scared, they're afraid. And of course, the issue that now every politician is uh, 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 talking about, which is the emerging global achievement gap. This is everybody wants to be Finland. Everybody wants to be like the Finns. And I have a theory, how do you get to, the fin to Finland? And we can talk about that maybe, maybe later. You, you have to start with a Lutheran culture that has no stomach for it gigantic inequalities. That's not what, what people want to hear as the first point of how the Finns got the best schools the world has ever seen. You start with equality. But of course, the global achievement gap is um, a national emergency today. It starts very early. The data tell us that 81% of the children in the developed world are enrolled in preschool. Only 69% of the children in our country are enrolled in preschool. Whereas two generations ago, we led the world in the percentage of high school graduates. 
Today, we're at a very mediocre 11th place. More alarming are the projections recently released, again, by the OECD. Among those 25-year-old and younger, the US now ranks an abysmal 23rd in the estimates of youth and emerging adults who will complete high school over a lifetime. Two generations ago, we ranked third in the world in college graduation rates. Comparative OECD data now show that less than 50% of Americans, 25 to 34 year olds, will complete college, while 31% of college students drop out in the world's high income countries. In our country, 50% of our students will drop out of school. Three features then align for reflecting upon the nexus between mass migration, globalization, and education. First, we need to start with three fundamental features we were talking about in our table that make uh, immigration in our country, in the world stage, quite exceptional. First, we now have three times the number of, uh, uh, of uh, immigrants than the second largest country of immigration. Second, while a dozen countries send the large, large numbers of immigrants, we have the most diverse immigrant population the world has ever seen. Third, while our country, we are, <coughs> we are less than 5% of the world's population, we probably today, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a little water. <coughs> While we're less than 5% of the world's population, we probably have a quarter of the world's unauthorized. Approximately six million children in our country and youth are growing up in a household headed by an unauthorized parent. This is unique, there is no if, if you take the unauthorized population of a country, it's like combining Denmark and Switzerland into one. That's the number of people that are living in the shadows. Over 4.5 million children in our country are citizen children who grow up in a household headed by an unauthorized uh, immigrant. How these young people fare will have extraordinary implications for our own future. Also, what kind of nation we're becoming. The data on the unauthorized are scant by research by, by Hiro Yoshikawa at NYU, Carola Suarez Orozco at UCLA and others suggest that young immigrants growing up in the shadows face extraordinary difficult odds, even citizen children. I want to give you a taste of a new initiative which has released two studies uh, at, at, uh, at UCLA uh, I want to focus uh, briefly on the Andocchio Scholar National Survey, focusing on the college experiences of undergraduate Andocchio scholars in uh, our country today. This is the largest uh, data set of, uh, of, uh, of its kind. The Andocchio Scholar sample consisted of over 920 students ranging in ages from 18 to 30, 54 percent female, attending uh, community college, four-year public, four-year private, youth ranging in age from days after birth to uh, 16 at the point of entry. Um, the the mean uh, year uh, for their uh, age at entry was 6.4 year olds. Growing up in the shadows, millions of children and youth pay a penalty over and beyond poverty, segregation, and concentrated disadvantage. The crisis of unauthorized immigration undermines the family's 
symbolic coherence, and social cohesion. Who among the six million children and youth in liminality can feel safe and at home when the Obama administration has set new records dismembering families by deporting well over two million people during his administration. The Andocchio Scholar data set tell of a sequela paid in the currency of fear, anxiety, and depression by millions of children and youth, citizens, many of them de jure, but de facto orphans of the state. Youth for whom, as Hannah Arendt put it beautifully in the, I think is the eighth chapter on her eternal book, The Origins of Authoritarianism, children and youth who day in and day out lose the right to have rights, the fundamental for democratic promise. Do we now have a subcast of citizens for whom the 14th Amendment is just an elusive mirage. Note the statistically significant rates of reported anxiety in, among the Andocchio scholars in our sample. For the young men, uh, it's something like, it's over three times, uh, over five times the, uh, the rate in the, in the, in the general uh, population. Immigrants arrive in our country with all kinds of advantages, the so-called healthy immigrant paradox. They tend to be healthier than comparable non-immigrant samples. They tend to be more optimistic than non-immigrants looking at the future. They have a robust connection with the US labor market. This is how Europe and our country differ enormously. The unauthorized population of the United States is deeply connected to the labor market. If you want to understand what's going on in Paris, my first teaching job was at the Ecole des Études in, in Paris 30 years ago. If you want to understand what's going on in Paris, you need to understand that in the second generation, the unemployment rates are over 50% for the children of immigrants. This is unheard of in our country. Immigrants in our country have a muscular connection to the US labor market. They're eager to learn English. In fact, we are a cemetery for languages, as Dante said. The Italians brought the, the, the la armoniosa lingua di Dante Alighieri, the most beautiful, arguably, language in the world, the language of the divine comedy. You want to understand yourself and the world? All you have to do is read the divine comedy. And this language died in Brooklyn and in Red Hook and in the Lower East Side and in Chicago and in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, okay? Immigrants are learning English faster than ever, certainly faster than they learned English 100 years ago. We can talk more about that. And lastly, they tend to marry outside, outside their own immigrant groups at exogamic rates not seen in any other country of immigration. A third of all Puerto Ricans in New York marry outside their group in the first generation. This is the American story. Massive racial, ethnic mixing in the past and today. This is true of Hispanics, this is true of Asians, this is true of Caribbeans. Above all, Immigrants want to belong. These are the data, again, the Andocchio Scholar data on if you were eligible in the future, would you apply to become a US citizen? The data tell you the story. New data suggests that Latino young children, our largest immigrant origin student population, enter our, score, uh, our schools on par with or exceeding their peers on important health and socio-emotional skills what's fundamental according to the new uh, research in early childhood education. This is what, what in Spanish we call educación, 
gets you. This is the socio-emotional component that our colleagues in psychology operationalize in very sophisticated ways. We can say that immigrants in our country come with an educación advantage. They leave our schools with an education disadvantage. Unauthorized status, triple segregation, and concentrated disadvantage are creating a perfect storm. An empire of boredom, of mediocrity, reigning urban, urban education in too many of our cities interrupt for too many immigrants their energetic momentum. They arrive with optimism, they arrive with energy, and the optimism and the energy gets interrupted by the pathologies of urban schooling in the 21st century. How then do we reimagine and reinvent education for a world of growing inequality, mass migration, hyper or super diversity, and unprecedented numbers of young people living in the shadows of the law. First, I think we need to be clear to the, as to the purposes of education. In our country, 99% of the energy is consumed by my third bullet here, the idea of education for the transition to an ever more globally integrated labor market. You read through the endless speeches of Barack Obama, and when he talks about education, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about education qua the labor market. Let me remind you that this is not how the Greeks, for example, first imagined the idea of education for a democratic society. Education for doing and living well. The flourishing ideal, the Aristotelian ideal of eudaimonia, the flourishing of the human spirit. I once wrote a book on globalization and education, and I got two Nobel Prize winning physicists to write nice blur blurbs, but that wasn't the big deal. The big deal was that Oprah wrote a blurb, that's what matters in our country today, and she said something, it was one sentence, but it said it all, education is freedom. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, education is freedom. That's what the, what the Greeks sort of, uh, she got the memo from Ar Aristotle, education is freedom. Next year, next year is going to be the 100th year celebration of the publication of a book that changed the course of our democracy. The book by a philosopher named John Dewey. It's going to be a 100 year publication of education and democracy. Education for civic engagement, education for belonging, education for cultural citizenship is a narrative that has disappeared in our manic preoccupation with global competition and the 21st century labor market. But we need to step back and think through the purposes of education moving forward. The case for education in the 21st century is the case for unprecedented human diversity. This is the dream of the cosmopolitanists triumph, triumphing over the, the, the dreams of the German romantics. Children growing up today, especially in our state of California, are more likely than in any previous generation of human history to face a life of working and networking, loving and living with others from different national, linguistic, religio religious, and racial backgrounds. Therefore, working across cultural and linguistic boundaries will henceforth have arguably the most premium in education. The case for education has been made before, and we don't need to reiterate it here. The data are overwhelming, from sociology to economics, from psychology to health. Many have mapped now the effects of education, often measured in years of schooling on individual socioeconomic mobility, human capital, social cohesion, social capital, health, and well-being. The preponderance of evidence is hardly surprising. Schooling tends to generate powerful virtue cycles. 
Perhaps the most exciting of the new findings comes on the nexus of health, school literacy, and uh, social, uh, uh, social uh, outcomes throughout the world. And this is the work of Bob Levine. Uh, Tony's, uh, Tony, I think, took a course with Professor Levine uh, at Harvard when he was working on, this, uh, on these data. While the practical results of education should be lauded, that ought to be the beginning, not the end of the conversation. What should the purpose of a formal education in the 21st century be? What are the relationships to a happy life worth living? How can education be put to the service of human freedom, dignity, solidarity, and lifelong engagement with the world? While these essential questions have been part of the archaeology of education in many, many different traditions, Western and, other, and others alike, globalization subverts the parochial tendency to stop the conversation and limit the conversation to the local realities in the imagined bounded nation state. The paradox of the 21st century remains that while education is local, the deep problems that are shaping our future are indisputably global. Once the education of all of California's children will lead us to this fundamental paradox. We live local lives in a global world. Thank you very much. Harms rather than helps minority students due to a phenomenon he termed mismatch. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about affirmative action, specifically in other policies that are aimed at equaling the playing field for minority students? Thank, Thank you so much. That's a terrific question. Let me, say, let me tell you a story of a 17-year-old that had to escape his country of Argentina, escaping a military dictatorship, who arrived in the United States, arrived in California, arrived in the city of Los Angeles, and worked his way up to uh, Northern California. And at night, started working on a, in a gas station, cleaning, cleaning offices, doing any job uh, he could find. And eventually, he enrolled um, in community college. And after two years in community college, through affirmative action, he moved to the University of California at Berkeley. And 15 years after being released at Berkeley, was inducted into one of the oldest, most prestigious chairs at Harvard University. So I'm the product of affirmative action. I have a deep uh, um, uh, personal uh, story that would really reject the claims of uh, scholars that are trying to deploy uh, methodologies that are, I think, aluctanous to the fundamental problem at hand. I think that uh, that's as clear an answer as I can give. Thank you so much for your speech. So I actually immigrated from South Korea when I was 11. And I remember uh, a lot of my peers, education was a huge factor in immigration. So I knew some families whose um, their fathers would stay in the home country and the children and their mother would come here just to be educated in, in America. And now you see this huge increase in international students in universities because even though the United States may be lagging behind in you know, um, elementary and middle and high school, um, our universities are the best by far. So I'm wondering for international students, you know, uh, work visas are really hard to get now. So is that maybe something that the United States is, is missing out on? Should we give maybe more work visas to really capture this education that we provided for inter international students for them to maybe stay longer in the labor force? Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, I think that our, uh, our system is uh, completely broken and dystopic and uh, dysfunctional. I travel all over the country and people ask me, you know, my relatives came here from just fill in the, the blank, right? Italy, Ireland, Eastern Europe, Russia, whatever, and they did it the legal way, not the quote unquote illegal way. There is no line. Our system is, is, is thoroughly broken. We have a 19th century system for a 21st century uh, world. The, the, the problem of mass and authorized immigration and the dystopia that gets attached to our inability to, for example, manage fundamental contradictions. We're educating brilliant young scholars like yourselves um, who will then not be able to uh, get the, the, uh, the required pathway 
for uh, employment and residence uh, in, uh, in our country. We're in urgent, urgent need of, of, uh, of creating the architecture of a 21st century immigration system for a uh, global uh, uh, world. And uh, this is an area that is a, a, a terrible threat to U.S. interests moving, uh, moving forward. I, I, I lived in Cambridge. I lived in the university. Harvard has basically there are three little houses in Harvard Yard. And I, I bought one right next to the biology labs. And the head of the biology labs used to tell me, you know, you can't do science in the 21st century with our broken immigration system. You can't. Next time you're in Stockholm, it's a beautiful little museum, the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. It has a human scale. You can just go to the U.S. section. Two-thirds of all Nobel Prize winners for the United States are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. If you want to know what's new about immigration and different, is that it's much more dimorphic now. Never in the history of the world have so many highly educated people uh, migrated in such such large numbers. Our broken system is interrupting our ability to get the, the most from a system that would deliver more scholars, more researchers, more scientists uh, to our country because, as you suggested, our, our colleges, starting here, are the best in the world. Um, how many of you, uh, how many of you use a computer today? So John von Neumann, uh, an immigrant from Hungary, did the fundamental work that went to, how many of you Googled? I've Googled my way to, <laughs> to the parking lot I've, and, and find my way, I, right to where Tony put my parking permit, right? <laughs> how many of you use Google? How many of you know somebody that's had a bypass operation? First bypass operation was done by a Latin American immigrant at the Cleveland Clinic. So if you use your Google, if you use your computer, if anybody you know who was saved by, by heart surgery, thank an immigrant. That, those are the advantages immigration have, have uh, given our, uh, our country. And um, uh, we're falling behind because the system it just doesn't work. Yes, there's somebody back there. Um, thank you for your talk. I think they gave me the microphone first for some reason. Um, sorry. So, um, just one question. So, you mentioned that um, the education system really stifles the creativity and the longing for freedom, and, um, and globalization has a really big part of that. Uh, without transcending the entire system, how can we change those conversations into a more into a more critical stance, such as, for example, um, placing globalization as not a inevitable consequence, but more as a strategic consequence from certain you know, free trade policies and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and narratives of like NAFTA pushing Mexican immigrants into the United States as opposed to them voluntarily coming, which is like the most prevalent narrative of immigration. Um, so how do we get those critical dialogues into the system without completely, you know, destroying it or whatever? Well, I think that this is where, where, you, where you come in. This is where the, there, is a, there is an obligation to uh, normalize how we think about uh, immigration. Uh, I think there's an obligation to lower the temperature. Um, I think there's an obligation to a aim to the better, to talk to the better angels of our nature, not to the, not to the thalamic regions of the brain where the anger and the fear get mobilized, more the neocortex. And it is a story of our species, it is a story of our country, uh, it is a story of the future. Um, and the, the, the causes and the consequences of immigration are very complex. The best data I can give you is this, 3%, keep that in mind. You really have to punctuate the equilibrium to get people to move en masse. Mass migration doesn't happen otherwise. 
you need to punctuate the equilibrium, and then you will see corridors between sending and receiving regions that are deeply interconnected. Go to London, and you'll understand. There is nothing at random about the, 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 the extraordinary transformation of that city. Uh, here we're in the state of California. In order to understand our current predicament, we need to understand NAFTA and way before. Um, so I'm an educator, so <laughs> my belief is um, discuss, be rational, have the facts on your side. Okay, so I'm a little bit nervous, so I'll try to get the question out. But you said that LA and Paris were our only cities. Is that, what you, is that correct? Is that what you said? So what I said was, you know, it was a metaphor. Yeah. Jefferson had a beautiful saying, which is a, a kind of a globalization 1.0. He said, we all love two cities. We love our city and we love Paris because, of course, it's a city of lights, mm -hmm. it's a city of rationality, the city of the enlightenment. Yes, um, but what do you say that San Francisco's role in everything is? Because if you don't know, Google, Facebook, all these social media that we utilize to spread our messages are being utilized by, by companies that are being established in San Francisco. So I'm learning right now about social syncrasy and how emotional contagion works. I think uh, we don't have a theory of mind right now. We don't have the ability to empathize and we're going towards our greed and our corruption and these are circuits in our brains but we have the ability to be altruistic and I think it's on the shoulders of people in San Francisco uh, or people who are the head of companies to, to have this, I don't know, I, I, that's just to be able to spread positive messages. So what do you think that San Francisco or places where technology is created What's their role? Thank you so much. Um, so I, I think, uh, in a way, what you're saying is um, San Francisco is, I guess, the new, if, if New York is Rome, if New York is the capital of the empire, if New York is what, where the, the, all the points, where all the points come uh, together, then in a way San Francisco is the Florence. San Francisco is the, the, the point where these um, new human interventions are being envisioned and are being um, realized. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much. So yes, thank you so much. You know, I I I I think uh, I think that's a that's a, a that's a terrific uh, intervention. I, again, I, I'm an educator, so I, I'm 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 deeply moved by the message of uh, Paolo Freire, the the message of of Conscientizao, the message of bringing consciousness, bringing humanity, bringing the humane into 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 the human into the human uh, conversation. So, um, my hope, my, my deep belief is that um, education is, is, is freedom. Education is the way to change, to change the world. Education is the way to change yourself, uh, to change others, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to change uh, uh, the world. It is through the expanding of, of, again, what the great Paolo Freire called 
conscientizado that you come to a deeper understanding of, 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 of the world in all the complexities in, in both its full potential and in also in its, uh, in its inhumanity. We will have time for one more question. Hi, Professor. Um, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on a point you made earlier with respect to what we can learn from the Finns. You stated that you would come back to it. I just wanted you to clarify because obviously in terms of equality of both education and just general opportunity in life, one could make the counter argument that that sort of equality is only possible in such a small homogenous society and it might not work in something that's as culturally diverse as the US. So I just wanted you to right. elaborate on that point and address yeah. the kind of Matt. cultural homogen homogeneity issue. Thank you so much, that, that's a terrific question. So when I say, I, you know, uh, the Finns is, this is the, the, the current malaise is, why can't we be more like the Finns, right? So if you look at the, the PISA data, the PISA is a program for international student assessment. These are the international rankings. Um, I was recently with the, with the uh, former uh, Minister of Education, uh, the Israeli the Labor Minister of Education, and, and she said every time she met with the Prime Minister, she demanded that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister demanded that she, the Minister of Education, come with the Secretary of the Treasury, because the Prime Minister knew she was going to ask for money, and the only question he, the Prime Minister, was interested in is, how, are, how is this investment going to help the PISA ratings? How the PISA, how testing assessment has just been completely fetishized and are the, the center of how we think about what's a good education system worthy of our emulation. This is all a footnote to the point that the Finns, no matter how you look at the data, always come on top, right? And, and there's a beautiful uh, book called Finnish Lessons uh, by a Finnish scholar that it fundamentally makes the, uh, the argument Finland got to what it is in ways that are completely orthogonal to the, to the ways our conversation are unfolding in our country uh, today. It wasn't about um, economic competition. It wasn't about um, linking student performance to to teacher evaluations and, and or um, teacher sort of promotions, pay uh, uh, at all. So then the question is, well, what's there in Finland that begins to explain uh, how the Finns got from a poor, largely illiterate peasant population to having this dual education system that the world uh, admires? And you've told half the story. Half the story is, it's a, you, know, you can put all of Finland in about two boroughs in New York, I think Brooklyn and Manhattan, and you'd still have a little bit extra space, right? It's a tiny country. I think somebody can Google it, but I think the population of Finland is what? Six million people? So it starts with, it's a very, very small country. It's a very small country that is homogeneous. It is a small country that is homogeneous that is animated by a Lutheran ideal where tolerance of the uh, outrageous, the obscene levels of inequality that we see in our country is simply unacceptable. It is a, a consensus society where sectors, multiple sectors of, of, of Finnish society um, gather at the table and make deals. The industrial sector, labor, uh, um, the the, uh, the the public sector, uh, parents, unions, uh, to generate a kind of a consensus. It's very similar to the Swedish story, another Lutheran country. Sweden has increasingly more issues because Sweden has a very large wave of new, mostly refugees, by the way. The Swedish animated by the Lutheran spirit, admitted much larger numbers of refugees than almost any other country in the world. I mean, other than, of course, what's going on now in the Middle East, where it's countries like Jordan and, and Lebanon that are absorbing everything. Um, so I think the Finnish story is a very, very interesting story. How do you get to an end product that you want to emulate? 
through a pathway that is so completely different from every maneuver we seem to be taking in, uh, in our country. Um, how do you get to a society that highly values teachers? How do you get to a society where being a teacher is a very high prestige occupation? How do you get to a society where applying to going into the teacher education programs, you know, it's, it's as hard as applying to the Harvard Medical School. So I think the Swedish story, like the, like the, like, like the, like the Finnish story, like the, 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 uh, the Danish story, are, are very fascinating stories. I think that they're being interrupted at the moment, especially Denmark and, uh, and uh, Sweden, by very enormously traveling developments in terms of the impulses of the second generation children of the refugees that are not identifying with the narrative of the nation. They're not connecting. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Please join me in thanking Dr. Marcelo Suarez Orozco.